We greet each one this morning in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior. We're in a different position this morning, but it's such a beautiful place. Like our brother said, we might like it here pretty good. So for devotion, I'd like to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, just reading two verses. There's a lot more in here, but we don't want to take time from our brother. May uh, Ephesians 2, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> We find here, it says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. At one time, several people were asked, famous people were asked, what they would say is the saddest word in the English language. A poet, T.S. Eliot, said this, the saddest word is saddest. Oscar Hammerstein II said the word B-U-T, but. A writer, John Passos, said the, the most uh, saddest word would be forlorn. Statesman Bernard Barak said the saddest word is hopeless. President Harry Truman said he used the phrase, it might have been. Alexander Tulsi said atheism is the saddest word. I'm sure if we would go around and ask you, you each would probably be able to think of a word that would be the saddest word that you could probably think of. As I was thinking about this, one popped into my mind of, of helpless. Have you ever felt helpless? And I had to think of the brethren as they were there working at the church and they weren't at the wall but back and all of a sudden the wall starts to crumble and come down. Totally helpless. Nothing you could do. Not a thing other than pray. And that's a lot. But what I mean is you couldn't do a thing about it. It went. You couldn't stop it. And in life, there's many times we come to situations where we're totally helpless in our own selves. We can't deal with it. There's nothing we can do. And we got to totally rely on the Lord. And the Lord supplied a place for us here to worship. And that's wonderful. These brethren and sisters here at this place, may God bless them for offering this to us. Another word that popped in my mind was loneliness. Have you ever been lonely? <laughs> You know, it's so possible to get to the point where you're so lonely that you're in a great, huge group of people and you're still lonely. All the people around you. And yet there's a loneliness there that X in your heart. means no hope, in other words. There's a lot of trouble coming. And we find there, uh, dearth is, that the, uh, it's, it is prophesied by the Abigus there that there's going to be dearth in the, all the land. And that's not a very happy thought. And then there's another word in, verse in, in chapter 12, verse 1. There's the word vex. Vexed. The king was going to vex the church. The word vex means to torture, to trouble, to oppress. And so we find these are words that are sad words that we have to face from time to time. Here in Ephesians, in, in verse 12, we find the word aliens. He said we were aliens. In other words, we were strangers. We, were set, we weren't in the group. We were out, outcasts. And also the word, well, it says there was no hope. When you think of being hopeless, it's not a pleasant thing. And outside of Jesus Christ, there is no hope. And in this chapter, he goes on in the first verse, he said, and you both hath he quickened. He made us alive. And because of that, we can have hope. There's a lot of happy words. Hopeless. Uh, hope is one. Peace. Redemption. Salvation. Forgiveness. All these words are happy words. Words that can, as we're a Christian, we can experience these things of joy and peace and mercy from God. Mercy from 
mercy by his forgiveness that he gives on to us because we were sinners that needed a savior. Outside of Christ, there's no happiness, really. People think they're happy. They're enjoying themselves, but they're walking around as dead men. Without Christ, we're dead. Through Jesus Christ, we are alive. So there's many sad words, but there's many joyous and happy words as well. May God help us as his children to be joyous and to be thankful for he, what the grace and the mercy he gives unto us. Might we have prayer? <clears throat> Our Father, we come before thee again to thank and praise thee, the dart of great and a mighty and a holy and a righteous God. We're thankful, Lord, that you do love us and you care about us and you supply our needs. You're there to be with us and to direct us. And when we call upon thee, thou art there. Thou hast not gone on a vacation or somewhere else, Lord. And we're so thankful that you care about us. And we just pray for each one that is gathered here, bless in a special way. And those that might still be coming, give safety. And we just ask thee, Lord, to give us strength and guidance and just work all things out with, with our meeting house, Lord, that thy perfect will might still be accomplished and help us just to trust in thee with all our heart, not lean upon our own understanding. We ask thee, Lord, that you might bless these people that have been merciful to us and open this up for us that we can worship here. Just bless them as well. Bless Brother Merle as he opens up the word and opens up his heart and his mouth to share the word again, give him grace and guidance and words to speak and help us each to be able to apply it to our hearts and lives as we go forth from day to day. Forgive us, Father, where we fail thee, where we come short, and help us have a desire to honor and glorify thee and not to bring shame to thy name. Forgive us and guide us, and we beg it in the blessed name of Jesus. Now, dear our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>
bring you greetings this morning in the precious name of Jesus as we've gathered to worship. We worship, we worship the Lord, whether we worship here, whether we worship at our normal place, whether we worship in our homes. I trust our heart is in a spirit of worship this morning that um, we'll be able to worship the Lord. We're thankful that we have a place that's convenient to worship. I would be content to worship under a tree. And it's not hot, brothers and sisters. I could transport you to Kenya, to the church at our tomb, where we worshiped under a tree, where the temperature was average of 90 degrees, 80 to 90 degrees, didn't have much humidity. I could transport you to the mountains and Mount Elgon where we worshiped in a little bamboo hut. We take it for granted that we need a convenient place to worship. We're spoiled and we're blessed to have these opportunities to worship this morning. I count it a privilege just to be able to be together to worship this morning as a small group of God's believers. And thinking about our, our, our worship this morning, compared to the last service we had at Shrewsbury to now, things have changed. And we've seen God's provision in making aware that our church was not in as sound a condition as we thought it was. And he showed that to us by the disrupting of the wall. Afterwards, being able to see that there was some compromise on that wall. And so we're just starting to respond back and forth to the engineer of a way forward. Hopefully, we will be moving soon. Uh, it's looking like we can start to move forward. Just need to clarify where things will go and what we will do for sure. But continue to pray for us because there's lots of decisions that need to be made how we can fit within the parameters of the law and and everything that... that uh, is set in place by our government, what we can and what we should do in seeking direction. So continue to pray for us. We welcome everyone this morning that is with us online. We're thankful that you can, we can still be a part of that. It's not something that belongs to the building, but it's something that can transfer and move around. We appreciate Kenton being able to make that happen this morning. As we ended up the last time, I don't remember if I covered it or not. I briefly remember possibly touching on the, uh, the last few verses there about what our brother referred to, the dearth, the, the uh, famine that was coming in Jerusalem, that was there in Jerusalem, and how that the, the church there at Antioch took up them to um, Jerusalem, and it's, it's kind of a little unclear to me whether I preached, whether I talked about that at Shrewsbury, or if I talked about that at Swallow Falls, because I just preached through very similar lessons down there, so we'll just cover it briefly this morning, not a lot, but the thing that I want to draw our attention to is this church was here at and Antioch was made up a lot of Gentile people that would not have been under the, the Jewish idea that the Jews supported and gave and supported and helped each other in times of problems. And they gave offerings and tithes and, and all this. 
And here this Gentile group of people may have not known all of that. In, and so the request came that let's take an offering. And they did that. And they, they sent it to the, the Jerusalem council by Barnabas and Saul. They took that message. They took the, the message of help coming from other believers. And we know that we have that happening among us because there are people that have uh, had problems in our own congregation that our congregation has helped numerous of us and we help cross the brotherhood and we help in in different avenues to many people and i think that's a commentary of the spirit of god working in us that we care and that we love and we help other people in, in an outpouring of, of finances that god has blessed us and so we're just thankful to be able to be a part of God's kingdom that we can reach out to those that are around us in that way. And I commend you for, for giving being able to have a plan of being able to give, uh, and even sacrificially knowing that, you know, uh, giving till it hurts, I've heard said already in, in that way. So I want to move on into chapter 12 this morning and, uh, draw our lesson this morning in beginning at verse one says now about that time here the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church and he killed james the brother of john with the sword and because it saw it pleased the jews he proceeded further to take peter also then were the days of unleavened bread and when he had apprehended him he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarantines of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so we find that the persecution that is arising now is taking on a little different twist. The persecution started with the, the death of Stephen, and the Jews were adamant about getting rid of this thing of Christianity, and it was around that time when, when Gamaliel gave advice to the Jewish council, be careful that we're not fighting against God. And so uh, in this process, Herod, which uh, we want to just look at that a little, he would have been, Herod would have been Agrippa. He is the grandson of Herod the Great, which was a uh, ruler when Jesus Christ was born. And this, this Agrippa was of Jewish descent. His mother would have, would have come from Jerusalem. And so he has some ties into and understands somewhat of the, the Jewish religion. And so he intensifies the persecution. He takes up the cause of the Jewish leaders because a little bit of this connection. And so as he... As he sees that, he takes James, the brother of John's, John, and he cuts his head off, destroys him, kills him. And he sees that this makes the Jewish people happy. And, and so, the, the, especially the Jewish, maybe not all the people, but the Jewish leaders, he sees that this makes them happy. And so he decides... Well, he's on good terms now with these Jewish leaders. He takes Peter, knowing that Peter has had such a dynamic ministry. Peter has taken the message to the Gentiles. Peter has been uh, very uh, uh, pronounced in the leadership of the church. Although he wasn't the, the head leader, we find out later on that, that James uh, 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 would have been James the Lesser actually would have been the head of the church there in Jerusalem uh, uh, later on in our chapter. But we find here that, that uh, Agrippa sees this, and so he, he plans to kill Peter, but he needed to wait till after the Passover, the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would have been the Feast of Passover. He didn't want to disrupt the, the whole uh, service around that. And so he chooses to, to take Peter, and he, he captures him, 
and puts him into the four court, puts him into prison. There's four quarantines, which would be groups of four, four groups of four, 16 soldiers that would have been in charge of keeping him uh, in that time. So each one of them would have taken, <clears throat> taken a segment of a day. And it would have been in charge and responsible. So he would have had two, two soldiers would have been chained to Peter, that there was no way of escape. It would have been one at the interior of the prison and one on the exterior of the prison. There are like two prison doors they would have to go through. And if you go to a prison today, you're going to go through something very similar. You're going to go through uh, quarantines where you're going to be, where you go step inside, the gate closes behind you, you go to the next section. Before you get into the interior of the prison, you're going to go through two sets of, at least two sets of gates that you're going to go through. And so uh, Peter was apprehended. And he was there put in charge of these soldiers. It's a pretty easy job for four guys to keep track of one guy, they assume. They don't understand the miracle working God that Peter is serving and that Peter is, is worshiping and, and, and instilling that worship in other people. And so we, we find Peter in prison. And in verse 5, we find that... Uh, that Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And so the church is missing their leader. So what would happen today if the uh, officials would come and take Ray? He's our evangelist. He's done lots of meetings. He's one of our good preachers. And they would take him and put him into prison. And you knew at the end of, you know, like the week before Easter, they come and get him. And they put him in prison and they know, and you know, we know, Monday morning, Ray's head's coming off. Because it already happened to Brother Bob. What would we do? I think last Wednesday night, our prayer meeting would have been a lot fuller. Don't you think so? If we, we'd have had a lot more serious time of prayer. It wouldn't have lasted for an hour. This lasted all night. These people believed in prayer. They didn't know what the outcome was going to be. Even as we we asked for prayer for direction for the church. We didn't know what the outcome was going to be. Well, we continued to pray, anticipating things were going to go along. And God has other plans, and God brings these plans into our life. Where, where does prayer in our lives come through? What do we see? What do we anticipate? Prayer is, is asking God and, and communing with God, knowing he knows the future. We don't, and we don't know what is going to come to us. So the church is gathered. Uh, one purpose would be to comfort those who have just lost their brother, their church leader. They've just lost James. And so they were gathered to comfort, to strengthen each other. But they were also praying for Peter, that Peter would be released somehow that Peter would be able to be freed from prison to continue his ministry. You know, Peter was doing miracles, you know, just walking past and people were getting better. You know, wouldn't you want to keep a brother like that alive just a little bit longer? That Ray could go preach one more revival? What, what, wouldn't we want that? And, and I know that that's what the church was praying for. They were praying with, to God without ceasing. I mean, it was a continual prayer. And, went, and maybe it went around the room and around the room and around the room. And, you know, I don't know what the prayer meeting would have been like, but it continued without ceasing. They were in a season of prayer uh, for that. And so I, I want to encourage us that we don't give up praying for seems like unsolvable solutions. When we don't see how or what is before us and what God is going to do. And so we need to continue to pray for each other. 
And so we would be, be willing to pray in our secret closets. We would be willing to pray as we gather. It would draw us together. It would give us a purpose for drawing together to pray for the needs of each other within the body of Christ. Verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth, that is, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with cha two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and, and raising him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off of his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened unto them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And so the angel comes. Peter. Peter. You, you, you wake up from a dream, and you're like, Wondering where it came from. Is this real? The, you know, trying to understand what is happening. So Peter's laying there. He's chained. He's content. In the midst of this, knowing that probably tomorrow, I'm going to heaven. Knowing that tomorrow is the end of my life. He knows what happened to his brother James, brother and Lord James. He knows what happened to him. He knows the plans that, that Herod has for him. They've been enduring persecution, and, and he's able to sleep. I kind of would enjoy that. Stress of life can keep you from sleeping. And it does. It keeps us on our knees in prayer. Whether we're laying on our beds praying or, or we get up and pray or whatever. But here Peter is in a deep sleep, resting between two soldiers, knowing that tomorrow I'm going to be with Jesus. That's the only thing that can give us comfort in the face of death, knowing that when we die, if we know Jesus, we're going to be with in paradise with him, with the rest of the believers that have gone on. Uh, and so it takes Peter just a little bit to realize that this is all happening. He feels the chains fall off of his hand. The soldiers are there. I don't know if they're laying down sleeping, but they probably are. They're all just laying there. Chains fall off. There's light for him to see, to get his sandals, to get his coat. He says, come on, get ready to go. We're going along with me. And he's like, where are we going? They get to the door, and the door. He walks through the door to get to the outer door. The guy opens up, and says, "Have a good night." He said, "Says he opened it onto them of his own, and eh, have a good night." I guess. I guess. Hair said, "You can go." I don't know what went through the thought of of this soldier out there, but he opened the door and left them out. And so the angel walks with Peter. Doesn't say that he said anything, but after all, he leaves. I, you know, I just, I just wonder what happened. What went through Peter's mind? You know, when he finally realized that he was leaving prison. I know what I would do. Where am I supposed to go, and what am I supposed to do? You think Peter asked that question? No, he was going to face death. The angel takes him out, and he's walking him with him on one street, starting him in the right direction. Uh, there's too much. It's not written here. that I wonder, you know, I'm sure as, much, as, as adamant as Peter was about everything in life, you know, he always asked Jesus. He was always there. I, I'm pretty sure that Peter asked this angel a question. So what am I supposed to do now, and where am I supposed to go? Who are you? 
Who sent you? You know, all these questions could come rolling in your mind when, when you meet someone new. Don't you ask those questions? We do. We ask, well, who are you? Who are you related to? How do you know me? You know, people say, well, I know you. How do you know me? You know, those questions. So I, I just, I can't think that it would have been, they would have just been walking along, Peter not saying anything. That's not Peter. He's asking questions what to do. And so he continues to uh, move along. He started down the road, and Peter comes up to the, uh, the, the prayer meeting. That brings us into verse 12. And when, he could, and when he had considered these things, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where, where, where many were gathered together praying. And Peter knocked at the door of the gate. A damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, <coughs> excuse me, and, but ran in and told how Peter stood by, before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoning unto them with the hand, to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. So Peter shows up at the prayer meeting. The doors are locked. They're afraid. They're just not sure who is going to be next. And so put yourself in that place. Raised in prison. The rest of us are gathered for prayer. Would you lock the door? When you know, when you know the officials of the, when the, the police are watching us and they're, they're who's next? I'm pretty sure I would probably be willing to lock the door. Just to at least give you a little bit of time to slip out the back. If you, if you, if they did break the door down, at least give you a few seconds when they knock on the door. And I wonder what happened when that knock came on the door. What happened to the hearts of the people? Ah, here we are. <laughs> Where would my heart be if I was the next one in line? You know, you know, well, maybe Marlon would be next. You know, after Bob and Ray are going, and Marlon or me. You know, we're we're the next leader. Where would my heart be if I heard the knock on the door knowing what is happening, the persecution that is happening? Where would my heart be? Where would your heart be, Sam? You know, you're a leader. Where would your heart be? And Chad, you know, they're, they're looking for the leaders. You know, they don't care about the rest of you people. They're just the, the Jewish people. And Herod, he's taking out the leaders to try and squelch this thing. Where would my heart be when you hear that knock on the door? Oh, no, here we go. Who are they going to take next? I'd be probably first in line to go out the back door. Maybe. I don't know. Hopefully I wouldn't be. Hopefully I'd be willing to sacrifice my life for you people. It's my desire that I would be willing to stand in the gap and take the suffering before you. But my flesh will be ready to escape out the door. I know. So these people are struggling with, with these, all these emotions that are going on. And this, this girl, uh, I don't know if she would have been a servant in that house, but probably or, or was appointed to watch. And so she goes to the door and, and she says, you know, she didn't open the door. You know, normally when somebody knocks on your door, who's out there? You open the door and look. Or maybe you peep through the hole. You know, there's different things you, know, you can do. But you normally would, would check to see who it was. She hears the voice of Peter. She knew Peter. She knew his voice. It says that she didn't open it. She heard the voice. And she knew Peter. She goes back and says, hey, hey. Breaks in the, 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 the time of prayer. You know, someone's praying. And she says, hey, hey, Peter's here. And you're like, what? You're crazy. Peter's in prison. He can't be here. No, it is him. I know his voice. I understand. It's Peter's out at the gate. Someone should go let him in. And they say, you are absolutely nuts. You, you're hallucinating. It's his angel, they said. You know, it's his angel. They, they maybe already assumed that maybe Peter 
already had his head taken off. And now his angel was visiting them. I don't know. They were praying for Peter. I wonder if they even anticipated what might be the options of the answer. Do you ever think about that when you're praying specifically for someone? Whatever situation they're going through, did you ever anticipate what God might do? Do you ever just think, well, if, if God answered this way or he answered that way or he answered that way, you know, what are the options? God can choose to answer a prayer however he wants to. But we find that... Uh, in the end, when they finally open the door and they bring Peter in, the prayer meeting changes to a praise meeting. And they start to worship, and Peter says, whoa, 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 keep it down a little bit, you know, they're out there. If they find out I'm here, you know, then we're all going to be going, just shh, keep it quiet. I want to tell you what happened. And he gives them the story of how God miraculously took him out of prison, and he says, all right, brethren, keep on, and he takes off. He went somewhere that no one knew where he went, especially that could refer where Peter went. He left in the, in the night and, and went to another place. And so we see the miraculous hand of God in the midst of persecution. And so, excuse me. We need to be willing to share the story of answered prayers in our life. Just the little things that might encourage a brother or sister, a young person, as they are going through a struggle in life, we need to be ready and willing to share uh, that message of hope that God does answer prayer. It may not be a release from prison, so to speak, but it should be a release of prison, of sin, when God changes our heart. Having a testimony of what God has done in our lives and being able to share to some, with someone of what God can do and God will do if we are faithful, if we seek him, if we are willing to listen and willing to understand what God wants for our life. I want to encourage us to, to continue to persevere in prayer in the midst of all the situations of life for brothers and sisters and friends and praise God for what he does do. Because he's an awesome and a wonderful God, and he provides ways of escape beyond our imagination in what we anticipate and what we experience. The church here did, never, did not anticipate seeing Peter at that hour of the night. More than likely, most of them did not expect to see Peter again. I don't know what they were praying for Peter. Maybe they were just praying for grace to go through the trial. And, you know, I think we pray for the same thing. Someone is struggling through a disease, the anticipation of, an, of a surgery, uh, cancer, heart disease. We, we pray for their miraculous healing, and God can easily do that. We pray for their anticipated surgery, that the, the doctor's hands would be guided by, by the Father and, and bring healing, that God would restore healing. So well, as we're praying, we pray multifacetedly what God could and might do, and I believe that's what the church was doing, not thinking that they would ever see Peter again. You know, we anticipate Ray's having surgery here not too long, and we're, we're already praying that, that the surgery would go well and he would be restored. What's God going to do? I don't know, brother, but I know he's going to do something. Worst case scenario, Ray's going to heaven, and hallelujah, he would be ready to go. I don't know if I'm ready to leave and go, and I'm sure you're ready to leave and go. But that could be a possibility. Can we pray for that? that? God would give us grace to go on? I, I'm praying that he's restored and he can, will help preach because I don't want to preach more than I have to, you know. We need this brother. We need him to encourage us. He's an encourager to us as the body of Christ. And so we pray and we pray and we pray for God's will. And these people did not, I don't think they really anticipated seeing Peter again. And there he is. 
wouldn't you praise? And we will rejoice when Ray comes back to church and preaches again after his surgery. It will be rejoicing, at least to me. I don't know about to you, but it will be rejoicing to see what God does in his life. And it will be awesome. Verse 18. <clears throat> Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And Herod had sought for him and found him not. He examined the keepers and commanded them, commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. And so the soldiers that were beside Peter wake up and they looked over and they I can only imagine, you know, sometimes when I wake up, you know, I'm laying one way and I roll the other way. I'm only half awake, so, you know, my, chain, my hand is chained to somebody else. You know that in the back of your mind subconsciously. You roll over and the chain just rolls along. So it's like, what? Where's Peter? Chain's not broken. It's not cut. There's nothing. It, it, the chain is still the size of Peter's wrist. And the one on the other side says the same thing. What would you let him go for? I didn't let him go. They get up and go to the guy at the door. Where'd Peter go? Well, I don't know. I've never seen him leave. They go out to the other. Where'd he leave? Well, someone took him. I just assumed it was that. You know, he, he said, I just opened the gate because the guy asked me to. They looked like a man of authority and I just let him go. I just assumed that Herod told him he could go. And I thought you guys let him go. A serious discussion going on, knowing they knew that they were taking Peter's place. They didn't have an option. And that's what happened. Herod, I can only imagine his face getting red and angry and said, You guys are a bunch of jerks. You can't even do your job of keeping one person. But as he examined all these things, I think deep in his heart, because he was of Jewish background, realized the hand of God. This is beyond me. And so he leaves Judea and he goes to Caesarea. He leaves that place of action. He goes to Caesarea. And so uh, I, th I think he moves on and realizing the, that this is a, a bigger battle than what he was really anticipating. <laughs> As we think of, of our role in, in, in the church, you know, as, as, um, as Herod realized the, uh, the anticipation of what was happening, and it angered him, and he moves away from that. I, I want us to go to what happens, what happens when a soul comes to Jesus Christ. As we think about our church, whether it's with our, our, within our own congregation or wherever, what happens when a, a soul comes to Jesus Christ? The battle that rages between the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Satan and, and all of that going on, you know, it should bring us to praise and honor and glorify, glorify God in this whole thing. It's because Satan wants to take them down and he wants to take us down. And so we, we are faced with these situations in life. We need to be able to respond in a positive way to those situations as we, we come through them. So... Herod, he leaves, he goes down to Caesarea. Caesarea is a, is a, uh, sea, a close to the shore. It's a town where, where a lot of games, a lot of uh, maybe uh, uh, entertainment was there uh, as a result of Rome. And, and that's where they kind of went to get, he went to get away. Possibly from the scene there in Jerusalem. Possibly feeling like a fool. Because of his, of his of God's intervention in the life of Peter, not able to continue that, and so 
he goes on down to Caesarea, and Herod, verse 20, and Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Balistus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in a royal pair, sat down upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of God, and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. And so as Herod goes down there at the games, there was this contention between those of Tyre and Sidon. They were kind of connected together by trade. And they wanted peace with with. Uh, Herod because Herod was over the area that gave them a lot of grain and sustenance for their people. And they came in the midst of this uh, uh, arena, so to speak, where they had the games and he was kind of on the chief seat. And uh, in our, my research says that he came out in, in a, a, it says here, uh, in, his, in royal apparel. And uh, historians say that he came out with a a robe or an apparel of, of shining silver. And at the very rising of the sun in the morning, it would have glistened off of him. And as he gave that speech, the people said, uh, this, is, this is the voice of God. And he says, yeah, that's who I am. I am the king. I can do what I want. And says, immediately the angel of God smote his heart and he realized he was doomed and I think it said within five days Herod was gone because he chose to receive the glory of man and not re reflect it back to God and we've got to be very careful about that in our lives that we don't be, uh, allow ourselves to become prideful and that we uh, allow pride to overtake us because it will destroy us from the inside. Uh, we can look at a lot of things in pride. Uh, in, in Proverbs it talks about pride goes before fall. When we get ourselves full of pride, we will fail. And I've seen that happen in different circumstances in life over my lifespan. I've seen that happen that people have been taken down by God because of their pride. And so I want to encourage us that we make sure that we reflect the glory that people give to us back to God who deserves the glory, what he created us for. And it says there, then the word of God was multiplied and Paul and Barnabas returns from Jerusalem to Antioch and they continue on uh, their ministry and that's where John Mark comes on the picture of there and we'll pick up there next time. We have a song? Or do you want to make announcements first? If you have prayer and then a song, I'll come up and make announcements. Okay. Well, then let's just, uh, let's just take a time for prayer. And uh, let's say, Keeney, will you lead us in prayer?
Number 82. <clears throat> I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou my ransom be, and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? My Father's house of life, my glory circle throng, I left for earthly night. I for wandering sad and lone, I left, I left it all for thee, as thou left all for me. I left, I left it all for thee, as thou left all for thee. I suffer much for thee, more than my tongue can tell. A bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I born, I born it all for thee. What hast thou born for me? I born, I born it all. What hast thou born for me? And I have brought to thee down from my home above. Salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What a love for me! I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What has the brought for me? Thank you. We've enjoyed the service this morning. I told Mo, I'm not sure if it's a new setting or something happened in my heart, but or his. I really enjoyed the message this morning. We're familiar with that passage, but he certainly brought in our leadership team here and. You know, I talked about the possibilities. One of the things that always impressed me in hearing from those, this would have been the Soviet era, when um, the minister was taken out by the secret police, who would step up? And always somebody in the group, in the, whether it's out in the woods or in a home or room, somebody would step up and to lead the service. And of course, they were the target next time. And uh, God always provided, moved in people's hearts. And when Merle said, if well, uh, we're so thankful to the new Fairview congregation for allowing us to use their facility. They are very gracious about it. There's a little note on your bulletins and by the way this Sunday and last Sunday's bulletins are back there for some reason nobody came and got any <laughs> and of course we weren't let it so we weren't there either um, but uh, there's a note we are grateful to the members of the new Fairview congregation for so graciously uh, welcoming us into their facility I would ask that we treat the facility with as much graciousness as they are lending it to us when I uh, asked Wayne then, uh, you know, about the rates, I'm sure when they rent this place out for 
parties or weddings and whatever, they have certain rates. He said, don't even worry about that. What all you went through, we're just happy to help. And, you know, it just touched my heart. I will say the Mennonites had that same offer up in a church toward Hanover. That one would have been a little more like we're used to. It's a little bit larger, but pretty similar in some ways. Uh, I must say this is very nice, and it's a lot closer for most. For us, it's almost the same distance. I didn't check yet. Uh, I think it's very close to the same amount of time to drive here or there. But for a lot of you, it's a lot closer here than running up toward Hanover, being another 20 plus minutes. And so we're very grateful for this. Um, at the, well, shortly we'll reconvene. And I, I think I'd like us all to return back here at, right at 11.30, if you just count on that, those of you that are teachers. And uh, then we'll have a closing song and prayer and dismiss the service. I uh, have some questions I'd like to ask at that time about several next several Sundays. But uh, basically, the restrooms are behind. You probably saw them as you came in uh, straight across here. Uh, the Sunday school rooms are to the left. And so there's Sunday school, two in the rooms on this level and two in the basement. So what we'll do is, if you go around the corner, I'll come out and direct you, but the smallest class, the primaries are beginner, well, anyway, the youngest, will meet in the first class. And then if you go back the hallway and it's just a little bit of a corner to the right, the uh, next group would be in the next class. And then the two older groups would go in the basement. The youth would take the first room to the right and the other class intermediates would go on back the hall and there's another room to the right. So uh, at this time maybe we can have a few verses and uh, because of some complications, uh, there was a Sunday school teacher asked but he has decided to go somewhere else today. So I'll teach the lesson and uh, therefore there'll be a little bit of a gap until I get back. But uh, or Merle, if you want to lead some songs or something until I get back, why um, we could do that. The offering this morning was $1,021 for our building fund, so that can help. And after meeting here for we don't know how long, weeks, months, not years, uh, we might decide to do a few more renovations before we want to move back if we like this. <laughs> so we keep it coming. <laughs> So I appreciate that. And uh, as we sing the few verses uh, that will be dismissed for Sunday school. Those that are left here <laughs> in the sweet by and by. <clears throat> number 123, I guess I could give you the number, ain't Number 123. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall.
110. Mm. Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing, victory is nigh. Oh, the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signals still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will. See the mighty host of Satan leading on. Mighty men around us falling, courage almost gone. Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will. See the glorious banner waving near the trumpet blow. In our leader's name we triumph. Oh, the Lord, for I Well, good morning. I'd prefer highly to be on the same level. In fact, going forward, I think we'll do that, even for the preaching. It's a smaller group, and I feel a lot more at one with you on the same level. But we'll use this for with the video and everything already set up today, and that's fine. Um, again, I appreciate Brother Kenton being willing to come early, and maybe even yesterday. I'm not sure, and set up, because that was very nice. I just met Lucy. Keeney in the hallway, and she said, Stuart is not really feeling very well at all today. So let's just bow our heads for a second. Lord, we thank you for this gracious hospitality we're experiencing, and we do lift up Brother Stuart. I don't think she knew what exactly was wrong with him. And we think of him and just pray for healing and your mercy with him and her today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to go to... 1 Samuel 14, this was totally spontaneous. Somebody else was asking, Kenton realized this morning it looked like the brother isn't showing up, and there were some out-of-state people around, and uh, so they developed other plans overnight. He did, felt he had a commitment last evening, and so we'll wing it this morning. Uh, my wife did read most of it on the way here this morning, and I appreciate that. And not that long ago, I had also read this passage in my morning private devotions. So uh, there's already some thoughts going. I'm going to take a second to lift this. I hope it doesn't too disruptive, if I can. Well, maybe it's pretty fast. I guess I won't. I would prefer a little bit higher, but we'll work on it. The lesson is 1 Samuel 13, 11 to 14, 7. So I'll just tell you. I do not, I love the brothers and each one of them were good friends, but I really don't get their divisions, <laughs> especially as it starts in on Jonathan and doesn't finish it. So we're just going to plan to do most of 13. Uh, we did not meet as a congregation last week. Uh, Merle's and us were at Lidditz, and so we heard uh, a great lesson there. But uh, I think we'll read chapter 13 and, uh, and then go from there. So uh, 1 Samuel 13, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were 
with Jonathan and Gibeah Benjamin and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel was also had an abomination with the Philistines. If you read ahead, uh, you know that um, the enemy, in this case the Philistines, controlled all metal, iron, whatever. And at the end, they, um, the, Israel had, to, if they had any tools, garden or field tools and stuff like that, they had to go to the Philistines to have them sharpened because the Philistines did not trust them with any, uh, any even like files and stuff. They didn't want them to have any metalworking tools because they thought they'd make weapons. So you see here how that uh, Israel was held in abomination with the Philistines, but the Philistines had enough rule that they could control even the use of metal. And the Philistines, verse 5, gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. Now, if you look at Saul's men, it says he reigned two years, 3,000 men of Israel, 2,000 with Saul, and 1,000 with Jonathan. Okay, you got that? 30,000 chariots. That's not how many soldiers. That's just chariots the Philistines had. 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand, on, which is on the shore in multitude. That's the soldiers. So there's no comparison from the amount of Israel, people Israel had and the soldiers compared to the amount the Philistines had. And when they come up, so you can imagine these horses and chariots and soldiers without number and pitched in Michmash eastward of beth -Avon. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait or uh, were six uh, in danger, for the people were distressed, then did the people... <laughs> So instead of facing the enemy, they had Goliath. That thing already happened, but yet they're saying uh, they uh, hid themselves in caves and in thickness, thickets and rocks. Did it happen? Now, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Am I? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, thanks, Chad. I'm, yeah, I forget exactly the place. Thank you. So, okay, Goliath didn't happen. You see, instead of depending on God, they wanted a king. Well, now they had to go and hide in caves, thickets, rocks, and high places, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over, yeah, anyway, I guess I should have known that um, Goliath is later. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's over in 17 and, yeah, chapter 17. We should know those basic things. Uh, Chapter 17, you know, it was 1 Samuel, David, and Goliath. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan. Okay, they're going east to get away from the enemy to the land of Gad and Gilgal, or Gilead. That was kind of opposite of the Sea of Galilee. And as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people trembled him with great courage. <laughs> now, it says they were trembling. And then in verse 8, he... Saul tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, and Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. <laughs> He's making a big show welcoming Samuel, but he disobeyed him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me. They were fleeing to Gilead, which is across the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee. They're getting away because they're scared of the enemy. Because I saw the people were scattered from me, and thou camest not within the days appointed. You didn't come when you said you were coming. We'll look that up in a minute, and, or two minutes. And that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore I said, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. <laughs> Listen, I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. We'll have discussion a little bit here. And Samuel said unto Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. And the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. 
and the Lord hath commanded him to be a captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. The Lord hath commanded him to be a captain. Uh, in other words, the Lord sought him a man with his own heart and commanded him to be the captain over his people. And Samuel rose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. That was north. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him about 600 men. So now he's down from 3,000 to 600. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people that were present with them abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And the spoilers, so that's like the, the guys coming, the sharpshooters or whatever, or the people to pick up whatever's there to, for their own use. The spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies, the radio, raiders, um, and one company to the way that leadeth to Ophrah under the land of Shual, and another company. In other words, the whole deal belonged to the Philistines. The Philistines owned it because the people of Israel fled. They were scared, and only 600 were left with Saul. And it says then in 19, this is what I was talking about earlier, and there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man. <laughs> Just imagine, every time you need your mower blade sharpened, you got to go down to the Philistines or you know, down to Maryland for us to get your uh, mower blade sharpened or your knife, if they let you have knives, they might not. Or it says, every man his share, that would be plow, plowshare, his colder, something you cultivate with, his ax, and his mattock. When you want to get them sharpened, you had to go to the enemy. And I'm sure those guys with the files didn't mind pouring it on a little bit about the Israel people, Israelites being uh, enemies. Yet they had a file for the Maddox and the colders and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So uh, it's interesting. It says in my notes the charge for sharpening was about two thirds of a shekel for the Maddox. And uh, the, anyway, it's just uh, interesting. Of course, they would charge them for doing the sharpening. And it came to pass on the day of battle, listen to this, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan there was found. So they had two swords among the whole camp. Would you even want to go into the war without swords and spears and stuff? Like, so they're going to battle with what? Pitchforks, goads, okay, you know, you prod an animal to get him to go where you want to go. <laughs> you that use uh, farm with hogs, you know, what you need. Now that today they got batteries in them and shock them. But goads with a pointy end, you know, and uh, that's what they were using because they didn't have their proper weapons. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. And then we go into Jonathan. I think we got plenty to talk about. So we'll do that. And if we get into chapter 14, good. If not, uh, whoever teaches next Sunday can t take care of that. Well, do you have any initial thoughts uh, before we start getting into the lesson? Yeah. And I guess it, he waited until he waited until he was in dire straits before he called God. And before he got direction from God. And I think maybe if the story was 